Content warning. Graphic violence. Majora's Mask. Chapter 53. The Man Behind the Masks. Part 1. His name was Majora. The boy was the greatest thespian in his entire village, and he took pride in that reputation. For days, the wooden stage would be barren, its ancient wooden cracks settling in the far corner of town. But whenever it was time to act, he ensured the thunderous applause brought its aged wood to life. Masked characters would tread upon its sacred promise, making stories a reality for the young and old alike. Majora loved nothing more than to slip behind those wooden faces and become anyone he wanted. Most recently, he recalled a crowd sitting before him on the grassy lawn, their rapt attention unwavering. Majora had turned away from them to slide a beast's face over his own, and then he'd lashed out on his acting partner, a helpless damsel in distress. The crowd had gasped, and Majora knew in that moment they'd believed. They believed him and the characters he created. Whether he was the hero, the fool, the madman, the conspirator, or the monster, they believed him. He relished that power to subject an entire people to the whims and desires of his imagination. In those moments, he was no longer a boy. He was a storyteller, conjuring feelings that made people care about his characters more than they ever could about himself. He was happiest when his acting days came. Majora stared at the abandoned stage just then, envisioning the next one. Hmm, will it be the dragon play? He hoped so. Anman would probably be the dragon, and then Majora would get to save Myra. Being the hero wasn't the most exciting of roles. He liked playing the villains better, but he mixed things up as often as he could. A large cart broke his train of thought. He stepped from its path just in time, keeping his pail of water close so it wouldn't spill. The potato cart rolled by, and the dirty man pulling it was not apologetic. Better watch where you're going, he said, continuing on his way. He didn't even turn to look at the boy as he talked. War's brewing in the kingdoms, and little boys stumbling around won't last long. The unpleasant shopkeeper disappeared into the dirt road's hectic crowd. The boy turned back to the stage. It was wedged between two large cobblestone buildings, and the alleyway behind it was hidden. The lawn separating it from the road was perfect for people to sit and watch, but Majora had been standing too far from it in the midst of traffic. Better get home before Mama or Papa worry, he thought. Majora ran along the road on his short, thin legs. He was lanky and pale, and his red hair and dark eyes contrasted with his ghostly complexion. His purple tunic was fitted perfectly, which is more than could be said for the threadbare sacks many other children wore. His bucket was filled to the brim with water, and he was proud of himself for spilling as little of it as he had. Wooden buildings and stalls lined the busy dirt road bordered by grass. Humans of all shapes and sizes hiked along the well-treaded road, accompanied by only a few Gorons. The plains were a bit too arid for the other races, though Majora remembered fondly the convoy of Zoras that had passed through years ago. He wondered if they hosted plays in their domain. It was hard to imagine a cave overflowing with water, close to the brilliant blue sky and its rolling hills. Wagons, carts, and horses made the road dangerous, but Majora was adept at weaseling through. It helped him practice blocking for his plays. He liked to imagine the obstacles were his acting partners, enemies and heroes falling before his clever guile and dexterity. He weaved in and out of the crowd like an expert until he reached the square. The large rectangular field was bordered by houses. The road cut through it, spiraling off into the endless plains of Hyrule. In the other direction, a thick forest trees were barely visible above the tall buildings and crowds of people. No one entered the Kokiri forest, though. It was much safer to follow the dirt road around it. The forest children weren't friends with normal folk, but thankfully they never left their homes either. Majora ran toward the house closest to the busy road, relieved to be free of downtown's hustle and bustle. Mama hung clothes on a line outside the front door, and she smiled when she saw her son bounding toward the house. 
Be careful with the water, she said. You'll spill too much. I won't, he said, immediately upset. I was doing better this time, he thought. Why didn't she notice? Mama had long, dark red hair that flowed past her shoulders in fiery waves halfway down her back. Her eyes were a gentle blue, retaining all the youth that the lines in her face threatened to steal. She turned back to the wet trousers and shook them out. Put it next to the basin inside, she said, already tuning her son out to return to her duties. Majora ran into his home of wooden logs with a thatched roof. It was no castle, but he was grateful there were multiple rooms and beds. His friend Slarp slept under the stage sometimes when his father was snoring too loudly, which is something Majora never had to worry about since his room had a door. Slarp brought that on himself for having such a horrible name, he thought. Apparently, the name Slarp had been passed down for generations, but if Majora had been born into a family like that, he'd have changed the rules right away. Majora's entryway led into the living area with a hearth, and it branched off into two rooms on either side for himself and his parents. Majora ran to the back of the house, where the basin sat next to a stack of chests. He laid the water there and turned to his parents' bedroom. Papa! he shouted, running to see Papa sitting on the bed. He was almost identical to Majora, tall if not nearly as lanky. Their eyes were the same dark shade, but Majora had inherited only Mama's hair. Papa's was as dark brown as his eyes. Majora, he said smiling. He turned away from the object in his hands. What is it? The small boy leapt onto the bed beside his father. The next play is coming up. I forgot until now. I think it's going to be the dragon one. Papa smiled, placing his hand on his son's shoulder reassuringly. I'd like to see that. He missed the last one. Majora knew, but he didn't want to say that right now. I think it's going to be better than before, he said. Randall will make some new masks for it. He paused, noticing the object in his father's hand. What's that? A ring, Papa said. The golden band was finer than any he'd seen before, and brilliant red and blue stones were woven into it. Majora's dark eyes widened in amazement. Oh, where'd you get it? He asked, fascinated by its beauty. Oh, our family's always had it he said, still smiling. You're just finally old enough for me to tell you about it. Why did you have to wait until I was older? Because it's a special thing, and no one can know about it outside of our little family. And one day, your family, when you have a wife and kids of your own. Majora's stomach churned. He did not like the idea of having a wife and kids. There'd be less time for acting if he got married. These gems hold a magical power, Majora, one that no one has ever captured before. There is a war fought in ancient times, and this ring fell from the hands of the wicked ones in power. Our ancestors won, and here it is now, our heirloom. What does it do? It's called the Ring of Elements. While you're wearing it, you could travel to the coldest wasteland in all the world, or the heart of a volcano, Unharmed. Heat and cold are nothing to the wearer of this ring. Majora didn't think he'd heard anything more amazing. Does it work? Of course, he said, and it'll be yours one day. I'm just excited that your mother finally agreed we could tell you about it. Papa's smile faded slightly. Just please, tell no one. You're old enough now to keep secrets like this. The boy nodded eagerly. I guess that means I can't play with it. Papa laughed. That would be right. He placed the ring in a small jewelry box behind him. Our family's better than anyone else's, isn't it? Majora said. I bet the Landals don't have anything this cool. Myra Landall was always talking about her father's longsword and how it was made from some magical golden dust... He would choose a magic ring over that any day. Our family's not better than anyone else's, Majora, Papa said. That ring doesn't make us greater, especially when it's a secret that no one knows about. Majora frowned. I still think it makes us better, he thought, but he kept it to himself. 
Eventually, he rested his head on his father's shoulder. I bet a magic ring like that could help us in a war. Papa's brow furrowed. War? An old man said war's brewing. He almost ran me over with his cart. Majora paused. I thought the war was over. Papa took a while to answer. Adults tended to do that only when they lied. Some people will never let go of the old ways, he said. But that doesn't mean we have to worry about fighting. It's far away from here, and we'll get squashed out soon. The royal family's time is over. The kingdoms of Hyrule won't be ruled by kings and queens again. We fought long and hard for that freedom, and they can't make us give it up. Majora had heard many tales of the once great and unified Hyrule Kingdom. Some of its kings had been cruel, while others were kind. One such wannabe king had started a civil war to reclaim the old ways, but everyone in Majora's town didn't seem to worry much about it, so he decided he wouldn't either. That old man was just trying to scare you, Papa said, hugging him. Why don't you tell me about your play? He drew in a nervous breath. This was the moment he'd been waiting for. He stood in the alleyway with open crates beside him, which overflowed with masks and costumes. From behind the curtain, Majora could hear Myra's high-pitched voice, and her shadow danced in the gap between the heavy red fabric and the stage's wooden floor. No! She said dramatically. Please! Where, oh where, is my hero? You can do it! Randall whispered, standing in the alley's dark beside Majora. The small, balding man wielded an encouraging smile. Majora wore the same purple tunic he'd worn three days ago. It was his nicest outfit, and it made him feel more heroic. He met the gaze of the wooden face in his hands. The eyes of a powerful man looked back, complete with a chiseled jaw and long, blonde hair. The mask represented a knight straight from the Sky Era. Majora heard Onmint roar alongside Myra. Your hero can't shave you now, he exclaimed. When the witch's hour is upon us, I will eat your heart and fling you from the top of the tower. Oh, woe is me, Myra said, her childish voice hardly convincing at all. I'm better than both of them, Majora thought. And the audience knows that too. And yet, his confidence faltered. I don't know if I want to be the hero, though, Majora whispered back to Randall. It was just the two of them behind the stage. The space between two buildings was their makeshift storage, and the stage shielded them from onlookers. Only a sliver of sky was visible beyond the towering walls of the alley. If only he was here to save me! The little girl continued from the curtain's other side. My heart will spend its final moments, er, um, yearning for the beautiful Prince Dashing to come rescue me. My love it burns and brighter than all the stars in the sky, and it surely will protect my heart from that evil dragon's teeth. Clearly, she'd forgotten some of her lines. Why don't you want to be the hero? His director asked. Because he's not interesting, Majora said softly. He's a good guy all the way through, and he's going to win and slay the dragon. There's nothing else. The greatest of actors can turn any character into a believable one. The red-headed boy looked up at his mentor to see him smile again. Majora couldn't help but return it this time. Myra droned on in her high-pitched voice. The moon is at its peak, and still, my brave warrior has not yet come to save me. Oh, woe, woe, despair and misery. Whatever will I do, my heart is a little bitty birdie, and unless my brave knight comes to feed it worms, I fear the dragon will eat it, feathers and all. That was his cue. Majora slipped the mask over his face, grabbed his wooden sword, and parted the curtain. He jumped onto the stage and was greeted by blinding sunlight. 
He peered through the thin holes cut into the mask, but it was all he needed to see the faces beaming at him. Several people sat in the grass before the stage, but his eye scanned for one person only. Papa was there, unable to stifle a smile at his son's appearance. Hark! Myra said. Is that the sweet melody of my hero's, uh, feet, while he walks, that has come to save me? Myra stood on the stage's far right, her face hidden behind a beautiful princess's visage. Her long blonde hair was visible behind it, and another small boy stood before her. His mask was green and twisted, an evil dragon displayed on its front, red eyes raging. Rawr! Anmen roared, jumping between them. You will not take my prize! Oh, hero, hero! Myra called out. I'm afraid you don't understand who you're dealing with, foul beast. Majora declared, holding his wooden sword high. I am Sir Maplewood, and Sir Maplewood always gets what he wants. He could feel the crowd's eyes burning on him. They were all watching. He hardly noticed the rabble coming and going from behind the crowd, as most would not stop to watch. But those who did were all that mattered. Ha! Huh, more like Sir Mapledong, Anmin said. When I'm through with you, you will no longer be alive. You will be dead, and your life will be gone. My fire will kill you, and you will die, because I am a dragon, and you cannot stand my fire. He thrust out his hand, and a reddish-orange ribbon licked the air. Majora gracefully dodged it, keeping his sword at the ready. Hmm, you are wrong, he said, very aware of the dull, predictable string of events taking place. I can't let it go on like this, he thought. I have to give them a show. His lips curled into a smile from behind his mask. My hero, my hero! Slay the fearsome beast, my hero! Myra pleaded from behind the dragon, waving a handkerchief in her hand. No, you are wrong! Rawr! You will not defeat me! <laughs> I don't want to defeat you. Majora said, still smiling. Anmin paused, clearly taken aback and losing his footing. He recovered quickly and flung out his ribbon again as the two boys circled one another. The red-haired one kept his fake sword raised. Uh, what do you mean? I, I mean, rawr, what do you mean? Majora replied, I mean that I came here for the same reason you did. I want the princess's heart. Anmin balked again, but to his credit, he recovered just as quickly the second time. I do not mean to love the princess. I mean to actually take her heart from her chest. And I as well, the hero said. You see, I need her heart for a spell, but only half of it. I want to make a deal with you. Myra scrunched her brow together. M my... my hero... Ajil? Anmin said. You take half of her heart, and I take the other. Majora said. We both get what we want, and neither of us has to slay the other. Anmin lowered the hand from the fire ribbon in it. Are you sure? The question sounded silly coming from a dragon, but Majora continued smiling from behind his mask nonetheless. It wasn't unusual for their plays to become impromptu performances, so none of this was uncalled for. His adjustments to the script were simply slightly more extreme than usual. Majora couldn't contain his excitement for what came next. No one will see it coming, he thought. He lowered his weapon and took a step closer to the dragon. Of course, I, Sir Maplewood, know I am no match for a dragon with such fierce fire. His wooden face was unmoving as he stared at the beast before him, his words laced with calculative ice. There was a pause. Then let it be done! Anmin turned around, and that was when Majora raised his wooden sword and thrust its end into his back. Anmin took a moment to realize what was happening and then screamed, falling to his knees. No! Rawr! Sir Maplewood has tricked me! It seems that I am sure Maple Dung. 
the boy slowly fell to his side, sending out his ribbon all over the place for dramatic effect. Then he lay on the ground, his chest only faintly moving as he played dead. Oh, my hero! Myra exclaimed as Majora pulled his weapon out of the evil dragon. She waved her handkerchief into his fake face. For a moment, I believed your tricky words and thought that my heart truly was doomed to die. You shouldn't have believed them for a moment, my lady, Majora said, bowing. My words were only meant to fool the dragon. Then my heart will beat on another day with my true love for you. <laughs> I'm afraid that's not true either, Majora said. That beautiful wooden face tilted slightly in confusion. For the lie was that I needed half of your heart. I need all of it. He stabbed the princess too, and Myra gasped, her handkerchief fluttering to the wooden stage. <gasps> oh, woe, woe is me. It appears my prince was no hero after all. Woe, despair, and misery. My days are over, and my heart is done. <sighs> She collapsed beside the dragon, and Majora pretended to pull her heart from her chest. He turned to face the crowd, raising the imaginary heart in his hands. With this spell, I will finally vanquish the great evil this girl's father caused as king. Majora held his empty hand high, sword held proudly beside it. His reign of tyranny will finally come to an end. With Princess Lara's equally dark heart, I will cast a spell that will end his twisted rule forever and free those enslaved by his family for centuries. The kingdom of Regalos is free. For a time, there was silence. Majora stood before the audience, hand raised in triumph as he smiled. They had his undivided attention. He was the dark hero, making a sacrifice for the better of the kingdom. Majora held the power of the gods in his hands, because gods, by their very nature, commanded reality to submit to their imaginations, and Majora had done just that. The applause didn't come as thunderously as usual. Myra and Anman stood to a small spattering of claps. Much of the audience had confused or concerned expressions. But I didn't do it for the applause, Majora thought. I did it so they would believe who I was pretending to be. He reveled in how unsettled they felt. They'd wanted a true, noble hero, but he had given them something much more believable, more interesting. Onmund and Myra took off their masks, and Majora did too. Eventually, the applause became louder as the other villagers overcame their shock. The three children bowed, and Randall came out from behind them, smiling. <laughs> Uh, great. Thank you, he said. We'll have more adventures in Regalos for you next time. <laughs> huh. He looked uncertainly at Majora, but the boy turned away before he could be lectured. He leapt off the stage and ran to Papa. Did you like it? Papa's smile seemed strained. It was interesting. You were, you were good. He's holding something back. Majora thought. Is everything okay? He asked. Of course, Majora. Why don't we go walk for a little bit? Are you done? Majora shifted uneasily, wondering if Papa was upset. You really like acting, don't you? It's my favorite thing, Majora said. His mind raced, bothered by the silence that had marked their walk until now. Is he upset about the play? Does he think I would do something like that in real life? Their feet carried them through the tall grass, its rich green coloring the land and eventually meeting the horizon. The blazing ball of fire where sky met ground spilled pink and orange hues over the world's pale blue. The town was far behind them. The many buildings, stalls, and houses were mere dots on the great field's canvas from so far away. A gentle breeze tussled Majora's short red hair. Did what I told you a few days ago make you think of that ending? Papa asked. What? He thought about the crowd's concerned faces as he'd held the princess's imaginary heart. 
That was just pretend, Majora thought. It wasn't real. I'm not a monster. About the Civil War, Papa clarified. I was just pretending, Majora said. He hadn't thought about it that way, but his dad had made the king and the royal family sound evil, which is exactly what Majora had done with his characters. None of it was real. I know, Papa said, gently grabbing his shoulder. They stopped walking, and Majora looked up at his dad with vulnerable eyes. But you may have made people in the crowd upset, that's all. I didn't mean to, the boy said, pulling himself out from under Papa's hand. Regalos isn't real, and neither is the princess. I wouldn't really rip a princess's heart out. I was just pretending. Majora. Papa placed his hand on his shoulder again, and Majora's racing heart calmed itself. When he faced his dad next, he saw his smile and comforting eyes. I know that, and the fact that you can worry anyone is proof that you're a good actor. You make people believe. That made his heart soar. He believed too, Majora smiled. I just want you to always remember who you are, Papa said. Me? The boy asked. He didn't know what he meant by that. I don't understand. Part of who you are as an actor, making people believe you're someone else, and that's an amazing gift. But you're also Majora, Majora Dial, and you can't ever forget that, no matter what kind of characters you end up making. He looked back at the distant town, thinking hard. How could I ever forget who I am? He didn't know. I'm sorry if my play scared you. I don't want you to apologize, Papa said. I love you and your acting. I just wanted you to know that you are far more important than your characters. Majora turned those words over unsuccessfully. Have you ever forgotten who you were? He asked. Roland Dial? Papa's surprise eventually returned to a smile. We all have times in our lives when we struggle with who we are. Majora watched as Papa turned back to the house, patting his son on the back. Come on, son. We should head back home before your mom gets worried. In his dream that night, he was the dragon. He slithered through stone hallways with a snake's tongue, wings pressed against his back to hide from the shouting. You're a monster! They had said. That wasn't acting, was it? Deep down, you wanted to take the princess's heart. Majora had no time to explain to them. They wouldn't understand. He slinked around a final corner and reached the castle's balcony. It was open to the stormy sky, and he jumped to land on the railing, his sharp talons gripping it like an owl. He teetered and fell. The gray clouds did not stop his descent as he plummeted alongside the tower's length with reckless abandon. And finally, he spread his wings. The wind caught them, and he soared. The clouds were his to command, swirling beneath each flap as he climbed to the heavens. He turned his great horned head to the side. Myra floated in the clouds beside him, her face hidden behind the princess mask. My heart! My little birdie heart! He tried to flee from the noise, but it kept getting closer. If I keep flying, it won't ever reach me. But it was too loud, and those screams, accusing him of such awful crimes, landed atop his head with the weight of an anvil. The last bang was a wooden crash, and Majora shot up in bed. He sat against the back wall, scooting his knees into his chest from under the blankets. The boy still wore his purple tunic. He'd been too tired to change before bed. His room was dark, though his mattress feathers and woolen covers kept him comfortable. His bed sat across an open door leading to their home's entryway. He couldn't see anything, except for the cooking pot, however. Majora heard footsteps next. They were loud, thundering. A foreign shadow cast itself upon a sliver of wooden floor visible to him. The banging had stopped. 
but he had realized more awful noises kept happening, but far away, from outside. More banging, more crashing. Something was wrong. Who are you? Majora heard Papa scream. There were other words too, but Majora was still blinking sleep from his eyes. He couldn't understand. Majora trembled as he pulled the covers up to his neck. Oh, oh, maybe, maybe I'm still dreaming, he thought. He tried to conjure a dragon's wings again. Those could take him to safety. No, you leave her alone, Papa said again. <laughs> Mama screamed, but her shriek was cut short. Then he heard a third voice the owner of the unfamiliar shadow. The boy shakily slipped from his bed and approached the door. Their home's entryway was empty. Their lantern still glowed with a small flame illuminating his house's dark nighttime interior. The front door had been busted in. It lay on the floor in ruin. The banking, Majora realized. Majora saw fire outside through the broken entrance. The distant downtown was aflame. People ran to and fro beneath night's darkness and the swelling heat, which made him more afraid as he approached his parents' bedroom. You know why I'm here, a gravelly voice said. There's only one reason a wretch like me would come crashing in on the dials. Majora stepped into the room, and Papa's eyes instantly found him. He'd never seen Papa look so terrified. Across the room, a stranger stood with a dagger at Mama's throat. She trembled, even worse than Majora, hands shaking by her sides. The outside fire's glow stretched closer, illuminating Mama's milky white skin. A man, garbed in all black, firmly placed the steel at her neck. His fox-like face was small and pointed, and his gray eyes glowed fiercely beneath his long black hair. Majora, go to your room, Papa said, his eyes darting back to the thief. Mama kept panting, unable to do anything but look between her husband and son. Majora did not understand Papa's command. What is happening? He thought. It was scary, but beyond that, the small boy's thoughts fled too quickly to cling to. He was rooted to the spot in terror. The man with the dagger whispered with Mama's red hair pressed beneath his chin. He has your beautiful hair, miss. Your little boy has your pretty, pretty hair. It'd be a shame if he got it all covered in blood, because your husband won't cooperate. Let her go! Papa shouted, taking a step forward. His nightgown was light upon his body, offering no protection from the late night wind roaring into their house. It smelled of smoke. Majora and Papa stood on one side of the room, and Mama and the stranger stood on the other. They were separated only by a stretch of wooden floor and a bed. Not until you give me the ring, the thief said, pulling Mama further away from them. Papa froze, and Majora realized he was trembling too. I don't know what you- Don't play dumb! The man in black screamed, allowing anger to break his calm. We're not playing games here. If you don't hand it over, I'll cut your wife's throat and gut your little whelp of a son in front of you. You hand it over, and they live! Papa started nodding. All right. All right. I, I, I'm getting the ring. Just hurry it up then, the thief said, drawing a lick of blood from Mama's throat. She screamed, and her husband panicked. He scrambled under the bed to retrieve something. And meanwhile, the thief turned his attention to Majora. The boy's heart stopped in his chest. He didn't know whether to look at Mama's pleading, scared face or the pointed, twisted monster with menacing gray eyes. The thief smiled. Majora backed into the wall. Are you scared, little boy? The man asked. Majora said nothing. <laughs> you shouldn't be. It's just a knife, and you're just a little urchin. Gutting urchins ain't a crime. Leave him alone! Mama said, finding the strength to speak against the knife. Quiet, you! The thief turned back to the bed. And hurry it up! My hand's starting to slip. I'm going, I'm going! 
Papa said. He eventually stood with a box in his hands, standing to return to the intruder. Stop right there, the thief said. Papa obeyed. Open it. He did, pulling out the thin golden band with the red and blue gems. Hold it up so I can see it. Papa did just that. The man with the fox face looked closely from halfway across the room. And then he smiled again. That looks like the one. The all-powerful ring of elements. Toss it on the bed. He did. Now, please, Papa said as tears pooled in his eyes. Let my wife go. And don't hurt my son like you said. You could have the ring and go. We won't try to get it back. And we won't call the gods. Please, you can take it and leave. You're right, the thief said. I can. One moment, Mama stared at her son with wide, fearful eyes. And the next, an awful, gurgling shriek broke from her throat. Majora screamed, looking away and cowering into the wall. Mama's awful noises did not last long. There was a heavy thud. No! Papa screamed. There was a scuffling of feet, another scream, and a second heavy thud. Majora kept his face pressed into the wall, willing the dragon's wings to take him away. <laughs> wake up, wake up, wake up, he thought. Fly away, please, fly away. A keen sense of danger flooded his veins, and Majora ran from his parents' bedroom without looking back. But his legs felt like noodles as he tried to run. He only made it a few steps before the shaking became too much, and he fell in the entryway. The boy scrambled toward the nearest wall for safety, but when he turned back around, the gray-eyed thief was already there. His dagger was bloody, and the household lantern hanging from the wall still glowed over them. Moonlight from the open door bathed the murderer in a smoky, pale gloom. His eyes were drawn to his blade, watching as blood dripped from its edge rhythmically to the floor. Then the light caught a red and blue gem in his other hand, and Majora looked to see the ring. The man in black fiddled with it, his gloved hands dark against the golden band. They were still screaming outside, but louder now. Are you still scared, boy? The fox-faced man asked, retaining his smile. He took a step closer, and Majora pushed himself into the wall as hard as he could. The murderer bent down so he was just an inch from his face, his dirty, bloody hands grabbing a handful of his purple tunic. You're just an urchin. Your family was just urchins. The something urchins had no business having. You got no right having something you can't even fight to keep. <laughs> The thief let Majora go and straightened himself, sighing as he half turned toward the way out. Ah, <sighs> I suppose I should keep at least half my promise, he said. The thief grabbed the lantern and moved to leave the home, but he stopped just short of leaving. A nighttime world filled with screaming greeted him. He slowly turned to face Majora again with his gray eyes. He smiled again. <laughs> or not. The thief tossed the lantern into the wooden wall, and the glass shattered. Fire instantly caught, spreading to engulf the doorway and stretch toward Majora. The man with the fox face was already gone. Majora only sat there and trembled at first, wide-eyed as the immense heat consumed Papa's books and Mama's table. The orange death grew taller, the cool night air fueling it as it spiraled higher to envelop everything front doorway was blocked completely. Majora found the will to stand. He half stumbled into his parents' room. The sight of their twisted, broken bodies made him nauseous. Tears burned across his cheeks as he turned away from the awful sight. But the heat almost trapped him in his parents' bedroom. He coughed on the smoke as his skin radiated with pain. Survival took over again. Majora ran into the kitchen, heedless of the nearing flames. They barely missed him. Majora climbed up to the window and pounded on it until the glass shattered. 
Its jagged edges cut his hands and arms, but he didn't notice as he fell onto the grass. He stood again and ran as fast as he could, blindly toward the distant forest. Majora looked over his shoulder only once. His house was a torch, heralding the funeral pyre his entire village had become. A thick plume of smoke rose skyward, a tall column of blackest night to commemorate their slaughter. The screaming and the heat were already ghosts to Majora, too far to possibly be real. In the fire's white core, the boy thought he saw the twisted smile of the fox-faced man. Majora sobbed as he trudged through the thick forest floor. Everywhere he looked, he saw those gray eyes and Mama's throat opening into a red river. He heard Papa scream. He saw the fire curling outward to reach him. He sobbed because his parents were dead and because he ran away from home. He sobbed because his feet were tired and he had glass in his hands. He sobbed because everyone he knew was probably dead, slaughtered by bandits who'd come looking for the ring his family had. Onmund, Randall, Myra, Slarp, the old man with the cart of potatoes, everyone that had watched his plays, all of his other friends, and even Mama and Papa. They were all dead, and he'd run from home as it burned to the ground. Papa. He whispered to himself, stumbling forward. The trees of the Kokiri forest were thick. Neither moonlight nor firelight could pierce its canopy. I... I have to keep running. I have to keep running, or the man with the fox face will kill me too. He ran, and he fell, and he ran some more. His purple tunic was covered in glass and blood. His feet were so sore. Papa. He whispered again. He remembered his dad's smile. Papa, where are you? Then his legs gave out for good. Majora lay in the thick grass, crying. He rested there for a while staring at the tree root by his nose. Eventually, he sat up, put his back against the tree, drew his knees inward, and stopped crying. He shuddered in the cold night. Papa, Mama, they're dead. They're dead. The fox-faced man killed them. He killed them for the ring. The blade had extracted such a horrible death rattle from Mama's throat. Majora watched it happen again, wide-eyed. Mama! A twinkling chime-like sound flickered behind him. It faded quickly, but it was filled with some characteristic of life. Majora looked up from his lap. A small white ball of light floated behind him, wings extended from its hidden body. It was a fairy. She looked at the boy sadly, and Majora turned away from her. Are you all right? The fairy asked. The boy only sniffled. A few minutes passed, and still the fairy waited. He finally looked up again and wiped his eyes. <coughs> no. He said. <laughs> Everyone I know is dead. A thief killed all my friends and family, and I was the only one who got away. His bald fists continued working their way into his eyes, and he heard the chime-like sound again. The fairy was now right in front of him. I'm sorry, she said, sounding sad. That sounds terrible. He wasn't sure what to say and merely stared back with blank, tear-stained eyes. You don't have to be alone, though. The hole in his heart lifted slightly at those words. Do you have a name? The fairy asked. <laughs> Majora. He sniffled again, wiping his nose. What's your name? Navi. Navi. <laughs> <laughs> 